This is Donald Williams, Professor Emeritus of Tacoma Falls College in the Southeastern US and a Christian minister and apologist. I'd like to talk to you about my new book, 95 Theses for a New Reformation, a roadmap for post-evangelical Christianity, Semper Reformanda Publications, 2021. 95 theses, 95 new theses, a new reformation. What, you may well ask, is all that about? When Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the Wittenberg church door on October the 31st, 1517, he changed the world. It was not the dramatic act of vandalistic defiance, it seems today. Those massive wooden doors of the church were the university bulletin board. People nailed notices to them all the time. Luther was simply challenging other scholars to debate him on 95 points he had composed against the theological legitimacy of the sale of indulgences, certificates for the forgiveness of sin that the church was using to finance the construction of the new St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. Luther had learned from his study of Romans and Galatians that salvation is a free gift given by God's grace alone and could not be bought with money or even good works. So he was troubled by the actions of Johann Tietzel, the 16th century equivalent of a televangelist, who was hawking those certificates in the neighborhood. He wanted to raise a few polite questions about the propriety of Tietzel's ministry and the theology behind it. So imagine a theology professor thumbtacking a note to the bulletin board in a modern faculty lounge. Nothing more dramatic than that. Luther wanted to encourage reformation in the church in the small way a professor could, by discussing ideas. He had no idea he would turn the church upside down and no intention of starting a new denomination. But the time was right. The new technology of the printing press allowed the message to spread like wildfire, and God had his own ideas. So, unfortunately, did the Pope. The <clears throat> conversation that Luther started that day is still going on today. We celebrated the 500th anniversary of its beginning, October 35th, 1517, just a few years ago. I'm a little late to the party with this volume, but it's kind of hard to publish a book in the year that inspired you to start it. You kind of have to write it first. Well, better, better late than never. The reformers, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and others, were flawed men who made many mistakes. But I'm convinced that they were essentially right about their main thing, the gospel of salvation by grace through faith, grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, revealed in a Bible that stands alone as our only inspired and infallible authority about that gospel. Their most faithful followers in that message in America had been conservative evangelicals. But as I look at evangelicalism today, I see a movement that has lost its way, despite having produced glorious consensual documents like the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy and the Laws on Covenant four decades ago. The movement now seems to have no memory of them and no clear idea who it is or what it stands for. Experience trumps scripture, health and wealth trump grace and sacrifice, and it seems like every week some prominent megachurch pastor or some well-known theologian feels a need to rethink or reimagine a doctrinal position that's always been part of the evangelical heritage or an ethical position that's always been part of Christendom's. We spend a lot of energy praying for revival, and rightly so. But I've come to believe that something even more fundamental is needed. Only a new Reformation can save us from ourselves. Well, that's very consistent with the original Reformation, one of whose principles was semper reformanda. The church should always be reforming itself. That's why I wrote 95 Theses for a New Reformation, the roadmap for post-evangelical Christianity. The evangelical movement in England and America was the tradition most faithful to the original Reformation of the 16th century, as it was mediated to the present through its earlier faithful followers, the Puritan fathers of the 17th century and the first great awakening revivalists of the 18th. But lately, as I've said, it seems to have lost its way. I think we need not so much to rethink or reimagine as to regroup, reground, and recommit to the gospel we are supposed to be proclaiming. Lots of people ask, how is a new reformation the solution to this problem? 
don't we really just need revival? Well, lots of us are praying for revival, and rightly so. It is a real need. But, as I said, I've become convinced that something even more basic is also needed, and needed first. Revival is a recovery of vital Christian life. But what if our Christian lives are in disarray because we've forgotten what the essence of Christian faith really is? In order to revive something, you've got to have it in the first place. Reformation is a recovery of sound doctrine, especially as it relates to the gospel itself. I think that may be a prerequisite to the kind of deep and transformative revival that we definitely do need to see. Others ask, why a new Reformation? Was there something wrong with the first one? Well, no, not in its basic core message. The Reformers were all about the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, based on a Bible that stands alone as the only inspired and infallible source of revelation from God. They summarized their message in what they called the five solas, from the Latin word for alone, sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fide, solus Christus, and soli Deo gloria. In other words, we're talking about sola scriptura, scripture alone, as the only infallible authority. Sola gratia, grace alone, God's unmerited favor as the way of salvation, the way that salvation is provided. Sola fide, faith alone as the way it is received. Solus Christus, Christ alone, as the only and all-sufficient mediator between God and men. And soli Deo Gloria, glory to God alone, as the ultimate purpose and end of it all. A new Reformation would start by getting back to what the first one stood for. How is it new then? Well, it's new in as, as in renewed, not as in different. New as in renewed, not as in different. One of the principles of the original Reformation was that the church should be simple reformanda, always reforming. The job of Reformation is never finished. It has to be undertaken anew with every generation, indeed, with every passing day. And the original Reformers understood that. They would have expected us to be needing a new Reformation by this time. Well, we've let that renewal go far too long, and the need has now reached such a crisis point that it will almost be like starting over. So it will be new in that sense. It will continue the work of the old Reformation, but it will feel new to many evangelicals who've lost touch with their own history. There's a second sense in which the Reformation we require will be new. It's a return to the old principles but they have to be applied to new issues and new problems that have originated since Luther nailed up the original 95 Theses. So it will be a continuation of the historic Reformation, but not just a repeat of it. We start with the original solas and then go on to cover a number of other areas in which we need to apply these principles. Looking at the interpretation of scripture, church ministry, evangelism, the worship wars, Christianity and culture, Christian education, and so forth. For example, evangelism. The Great Commission commands us to make disciples from every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do all things whatsoever Christ has commanded us. The verb is make disciples. But we treat it as if we thought it was to make converts not make disciples, make converts. Well, making converts is a good thing, and it's certainly an essential part of the process of making a disciple. So it's a necessary thing. But if we stop there, we have not fulfilled the Great Commission, and we have left the next generation in, even, in an even worse position in trying to fulfill it themselves. How ironic that the movement that named itself evangelical after the Greek word for gospel. The movement that likes to call itself Great Commission Christians has paid so little attention to what the Great Commission actually says. And so we make lots of converts and almost no disciples, and the Great Commission is unfulfilled. And you can see then that we don't just need revival, we need a reformation, quite literally a reformation of our whole approach to this area. 
And we will find the same thing to be true in many other areas as well. Well, if you agree with this analysis of our need, if you would also like to see nothing less than reformation for an evangelical movement that is in serious disarray, and if you would like to read a book link exposition of that need and of the Reformation that could meet it, I urge you to order 95 Theses for a New Reformation. I will leave you with the ordering information on your screen as we conclude this session. So thanks for listening. Well, 95 Theses for a New Reformation. It's uh, 25 US dollars plus shipping if you order it from Amazon. And you can do so at the address that you see there. And that's what the outside of the book looks like to find out what the inside looks like and begin trying to implement the program for reformation that it lays out. 95 theses, that's a lot of points of agreement. I don't expect very many people to agree with me on all 95 but I hope you'll discover that many of them are things that you will also see are very much needed if our evangelical movement is going to return to faithfulness. And as you see those things that they're needed, I pray that you will humbly and prayerfully begin to implement them in ways that you will find laid out in the book. Thanks so much for sticking with me through this talk. 